Karl-Heinz Brockenick is a professor at the University of Vienna with publications in many different areas of analysis, such as um, harmonic analysis, wavelet theory, time frequency analysis, sampling theory, and so on. So the MassiNet uh, database uh, collects 153 publications in all the above mentioned areas and some others like wireless communication. He has been the organizer of uh, several conferences, is editor of several journals, and recipient of uh, grants from the Austrian government, the European Union, and uh, the National Science Foundation. So it's a pleasure to have Charlie, as we know him, with us. And he's going to speak today about a new way of constructed function spaces uh, associated to irreducible unitary representations. Uh, what is called the uh, co-orbit spaces. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you for this kind and flattering introduction. It's a pleasure to uh, talk in this seminar. We had in the past said we should meet more often and discuss, but so far we haven't really uh, put that in, in, into reality. So this is a, a good start. So uh, new function spaces associated to representations of nilpotent Lie groups. Uh, it's, I would say it's a, a topic of, of joint interest between Eugenio and, and his collaborators and our group in Vienna. For seminar talks, I find it a bit uh, difficult. So I will try to, to explain the context first. And, and then in the second part, I will talk about the, sort of the, the, the new, new aspects. So the, 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 the goal is to, to explain some explicit examples of new function spaces, and they are attached to nilpotent Lie groups. The explicitness forces me to stay in low dimensions. And the main technical questions is, so you construct new function spaces. How, how do you decide, how do you prove that these spaces, or these families of spaces are actually different? That's a problem that came up uh, in a paper of Veronique Fischer, David Rottensteiner and Mikhail Rushansky, and they ask precisely how can we prove the distinctness of different families of function spaces? And in a, in a sort of abstract work of Marius Montoyo and uh, Beltizas in, in Romania, they also ask to invest more effort in concreteness and to compare sort of an existing family of modulation spaces with other faction spaces. So that's the motivation. And the whole thing is in the context of Corbis space theory. So this is something that goes back to Hans Feichtinger and myself in the 1980s. Uh, Corbis space, families of Corbis spaces are basically families of Banach spaces that you can that you can attach to large class of unitary representations of a locally compact group. And the original motivation was sort of to unify the emerging wavelet theory, the emerging time frequency analysis into one theory. So here is the setup. So G is a locally compact group, our measure we will need. And you look at an irreducible unitary representation on some Hilbert space H. Now you can form the representation coefficients. So let's see. So I hope the pointer is visible. So you fix a G, call it wavelets or template. You let the representation act on this G and you take 
in a product, product with F. So in other words, for fixed G, the map from F to this representation coefficient is a linear map that map, maps elements in the underlying Hilbert space to functions on the group. In various contexts that would be called coherent state transform, generalized wavelet transform, short time Fourier transform. There are many names depending on context. Now, the basic assumption is that in addition to irreducibility and unitarity of the representation, the representation is at least square integrable and actually integrable. That means that at least one of the representation coefficients, so one of these inner products as a function on the group is square integral on the group or even integrable. The consequence of this and the irreducibility is that you have a reproducing formula. So representation coefficients of this kind can be reproduced uh, by convolution under the well, representation coefficient of G with G itself. And in order to make sense of that convolution is of course convenient to have uh, at least this representation coefficient to be integrable. I will not, so this is the underlying tool. So in hard analysis, when you look at wavelet transform, you would relate that to what's called Calderon reproducing formula. But we are, in this part, we stay on the abstract level. So now the idea is, once you have square integrability of representation coefficients, you could put other norm, norms on the representation coefficients and by pull back from functions based on the group to the level of the Hilbert space, you could define norms. So essentially you take a representation coefficient, the G is always fixed and impose an LP norm. So you take the transform and impose the P norm. So this will be a norm. And if you complete, say some test functions with, that's on the same level as the representation space. So test functions, well, if you take a Lie group, this would be say C infinity vectors and could take distributions. So this is uh, an issue of course, but uh, I will skip that because in concrete example, it's very clear what you would take as test function. You can take weighted LP spaces, same, same thing. And you can take other function spaces on the group, say mixed norm spaces, whatever you, you like. There are generalizations to reducible representations, the questions of how, which test functions and distributions to take. It's all been discussed. Uh, so I, all I want to do is assure you that the natural questions in this context are answered. And uh, so the, the first thing is there is a natural way of defining fa a family of function spaces associated to a given representation. For our purposes, it should be irreducible and say square integrable or even better integrable because then, because then these norms do make sense. So let me first go to the example that's probably most familiar. You take the AX plus B group. So group of affine translations on the real line. And you take the natural representations of this group by shifts. So T goes to T minus X and by dilations. Uh, the dilation is normalized so that you get the unitary representation. Now, if you look at the representation coefficient of F with respect to Psi, okay, so in a product of F with the action of the representation on Psi. So this, if you write that, if you just copy that, it's this. So you can write that as a convolution of F with a flipped version of the scaled version of Psi. That's since the 19, 
ATIS is called the wavelet transform. So if you now impose a norm on the wavelet transform, so here I take a P norm with respect to the translation variable X and a Q norm with respect to the dilation variable S, and I impose sort of a multiplicative weight in the parameter S. Okay, I forgot absolute values here because I integrate from negative infinity to infinity. Then it turns out that this is the, a norm that's equivalent to the norm of F in a BS of space with parameters P, Q, and the smoothness, well, if I have sigma here, the smoothness would be sigma minus one half plus P, one over P, and it would be the homogeneous BS of space. Uh, at the time when we did that, we learned this equivalence from one of the many papers of Hans Triebel. And you can think about how, how to do LP or the BS of Triebel is in spaces via the wavelet transform. Now, one part of the research on Corbett space theory has tried to generalize this approach to wavelet theory. And instead of taking R and an action, a dilation on R, you would take, of course, RD and uh, have a group of matrices act on RD that contains some dilation part. So most uh, attempts for take more concrete versions of Corbett space theory have focused on, on this basic example and on extensions of wavelet theory. There's another example that was sort of already mentioned in, in the first uh, write-ups of Corbett theory. That would be a uh, relation to complex analysis. Uh, so you take class of semi-simple Lie groups so to keep it simple, let's take SU11. So that would be all, all complex valued two by two matrices with determinant one. And you have, uh, rep so for every integer, positive integer N, the representation acts on Z. So that would, should be on the unit disk by fractional linear transformations. And you have a normalization here that makes the this trans this operation unitary. I did not write down the representation space. You let you take analytic function and some square integrability. Uh, so for n greater than or equal to, this representation is integrable. And now comes the main point. If you take the G to be suitable, basically. It's invariant under rotations. And then you look at the representation coefficients. Then after some calculations, you find that is the same as integrating the function f over the unit disk, taking a p norm with a weight that depends on the distance to the boundary. And if you are working in complex analysis, then you recognize that this is just particular Bergman space. So the, 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 the connection of Corbett space theory to complex analysis is that the Bergman spaces on the unit disk are Corbett spaces of a particular semi-simple Lie group. So this was, this topic lay dormant until at some point I talked to Gesto Rulofsen and said, you can do that for other semi-simple groups and get Bergman, get results about Bergman spaces in, in, in say on the unit ball in several variables. So there's very, fairly little done in this direction, but I think this is an interesting uh, aspect of Corbett space theory. If you want to go into into this particular class of groups. Last example, and that's closer to the topic of this talk, is uh, if you take nilpotent groups. And here I want to say a bit more uh, because I 
need the notation later. So we take translations of F. I denote that by T sub X acting on F. Uh, we are now on RD. Modulations, I multiply F by complex exponentials e to the two pi i and in a product of psi with t. So these are unitary and the composition of two such a translation modulation is again, translation composition of translation modulation. They, they almost commute. So then we take the inner product of F with a modulation and translation of a fixed function G, say in the Schwartz class or in L2, and that is the short time Fourier transform. So these are basic objects when we deal with nil potent groups in general. Now, as a group, we take the Heisenberg group. I write, so this are, is R2D, so vectors in RD, Y is in RD, and Z is in R. And in the first two coordinates, we have just usual addition. In the third coordinate, it's this here. So you can think of that as certain uh, triangular, triangular multiplication of certain triangular matrices. So for us, it's always important to look at the representation. And for every real non-zero parameter lambda, you have a representation. Here is the formula blah, 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 blah. But point is the representation is acts on G by translation with X. That's the first coordinate of the group by modulation by Y, actually lambda times Y because lambda is a parameter of the representation and multiplication by two pi I lambda Z. So this is the so-called Schrodinger representation of the Heisenberg group. Now, if you take inner product with F and integrate over X and Y, that's fine. Uh, if you take inner products, then this is just a phase factor. And after taking absolute values, it does not disappear. So there is no reason to integrate with respect to Z. So if you take representation coefficient drop, the variable is Z because it's not relevant, it's the center of the group. Then you get a class of function spaces that uh, sort of our personal hobby in Vienna, so-called modulation spaces. They are simply spaces that are obtained from the short, from imposing a norm on the short time Fourier transform. So you could say you measure smoothness of F by via the time frequency concentration or phase space concentration of F. So this was also part of their initial motivation to investigate Corbett spaces. The, and well, let's say the initial publications did not cause too much response in the eighties and nineties. So basically we focused on, on this class of function spaces and then only later it turned out that maybe general Corbett spaces are of some interest. So here are some, some properties. So the natural properties, the definition yields a Banach space when the say Corbett space of LP with weight yields a Banach space. What's important is this Banach space is invariant with respect to the original representation. If you take LP, if you impose an LP norm on the representation coefficient, then actually it's not only invariant, but it's an isometry on LP. That comes basically from the translation invariance of LP on the group. You may have wondered, if you haven't seen that before, what about the dependence on the G? Remember, I always fix a G in the definition. Okay, so I fix this G and then it impose a norm. So how does the space depend on, on G? Well, not at all. If you take Corbett L1 as your space of test function, then you could take an arbitrary function H here and you still get an equivalent norm. Duality theory is 
understood as a corbit of LP, dual space is corbit of LP prime. You can explain what the duality is. Banach space properties are understood. So as abstract Banach spaces, the corbits of LP are always isomorphic to LP, the sequence space LP. Embeddings are well understood. And basically the embeddings are the same as the embeddings of the naturally associated sequence spaces. So for sequence spaces, LP is in, contained in L2 for P less than two. And the same happens for, for corbits of LP. So in contrast to the measure spaces, LP, the corbits behave like, it, like sequence spaces with respect to embeddings. What I would want to point out, the corbit of L2 is just the original representation space. Now, the main result I would say is the construction of atomic decompositions and of frames for co-orbit spaces. If there is time in the end, I would probably show that. But the point is with this uh, machinery, you get very general wavelet expansions for all BSF triple Zorkin spaces. At the same time, you get time frequency expansions for all modulation spaces. You get the atomic decompositions, goes back to Kaufmann and Rockbert, I think, of Bergman spaces. It's all examples of a single theory. You just choose the group and verify some properties. So that's sort of the general uh, setting of Corbett space theory. There is something in it for complex analysis, for harmonic analysis. And now in the Okay, second part, I want to focus on nilpotent groups. In a way, this has always been contained in, 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 the, in, in the original setup. So I can cite plenty of results on, on Corbett spaces related to nilpotent groups, but historical interest has gone to solvable groups mostly, a little bit to the semi-simple groups, but something, and it, there's no general investigation of Corbett spaces related to nilpotent groups. We always focused on Heisenberg group and never considered that any further. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I want to make a disclaimer. I'm not an expert at all on nilpotent Lie groups. I'm somewhat familiar with the construction of the irreducible representations by the Kirillov theory. But the whole point is, I don't really know much about it. And the blessing is that there is a, a book by Nielsen from the 1980s, where he gives classification of all nilpotent Lie groups up to dimension six with the formulas for multiplication for the Lie algebra, for the coadjoint orbits, for the irreducible representations, for the radical. So you just check one item to, check, to see whether that representation is irreducible or not. And when working with nilpotent groups and trying to say, verify some guesses, what might be true, we always consulted, well, flipped through that list and checked on explicit examples, what would happen. Uh, it's not a very fancy procedure, but I owe two, two publications and a, a PhD thesis by a student to this procedure. And uh, it's just great, this collection. If you want to test something for nilpotent groups, go to the no, low dimensional examples don't need to construct a representation and see what you get. And then maybe there is some general theory to be done. Okay, so Corbett space is related to nilpotent Lie groups. And I want to mention a small modification. Uh, you have seen that already in the Heisenberg group. There's always, a, if you start with a simply connected nilpotent Lie group, you have always the center that's isomorphic 
to some Rd. And when the re uh, representation is irreducible, then the restriction to the center is a multiple of the identity. If you take absolute values of a representation coefficient, well, then you see that uh, that will not depend on the central variables. So actually you can think of, uh, so this means if you integrate along the center, you integrate a constant along the center and uh, that's not going to be integrable. So the way out is always to interpret the representation coefficients modulo the center and talk about integrability, square integrability modulus center. That simply means that an expression like this is integrable modulus center. The nature of the representation means that representation coefficients can be interpreted on, on, on or can be projected to the quotient. So that's a small difference to, to the other classes of groups. And a, a second remark is that, well, in you know, potent groups, you have coordinate, you have sort of coordinates, coordinate systems. Uh, and when you look at the construction, then there, the representations are always realized on some quotient space, not necessarily a, a quotient subgroup, but quotient space. And if you write that in terms of uh, variables, that space is always something like Rd with Lebesgue measure. So in, when, when you look at concrete realizations of the representations of nilpotent Lie groups, the representation is always, representation space is always L2 of some Rd. So you really have concrete operators acting on L2 of some Rd. And so it makes sense to compare Corbett's with respect to different uh, groups and different representations. So what I'm going to do now is give you some anecdotal evidence of some theory theorem that hasn't been done yet. Uh, I realize it's a bit difficult to, to follow so many formulas. So uh, I'm not, never going to, to read the multiplication. Uh, the group G616, so this simply means it's the 16th group in the in Nielsen's list of six dimensional nilpotent Lie groups. The point of the multiplication of a nilpotent group is that it's a polynomial map. It's mostly linear if you choose the right coordinates and then you have polynomial uh, corrections. Now, if you construct the irreducible representations, you find a family of square integrable representations modulo the center with two parameters, lambda non-zero and u arbitrary. That looks like that. So uh, let's look at the an anatomy of this representation. You have translations with respect to the variables x5 and x6. You have modulations with respect to the variables x3 and x4 with parameter lambda and here with parameter mu. Uh, the function space variables s and t don't occur here. x1 is the center. x1 and x2 are in the center. And the function space variables s and t don't occur here. So if you take the inner product with f and integrate over s and t, then this here and this here are just phase factors. They disappear. So that's what it means taking the representation modulus center. And now if you just drop the center of variables x1 and x2, you're left with four variables x3 to x6, which I write as x dot. And the representation is simply a shift of a function of two variables by x5, x6, and a modulation 
of a function of the two, var two variables st by, well, here we have minus x3 lambda in the variable s, x4, x6 times mu also in the variable s, and minus lambda x4 in the variable t. So this representation, if we drop the unnecessary variables, is just composition of modulation and translation. So the corresponding representation coefficient is therefore just a short time Fourier transform, albeit a little bit changed by a linear transformation. But now it's clear if you take the LP norm with respect to x3, x4, x5, x6, and do a change of variables, that's just the LP norm of the short time Fourier transform. So taking the LP norm here amounts to computing the Corbett space norm with respect to LP. We see that's just the LP norm with respect to of the for, short time Fourier transform. So that's just the modulation space norm. So the last line is not visible for me for some reason. Uh, says it's not really surprising if you factor out the first two variables, the center in the last two four variables, it's just R4 with the usual addition. The same happens with a two-dimensional Heisenberg group. So modulo is the center, we have the same groups and uh, similar representations, I would say. So this group doesn't give us anything new, forget it. So the first example that I always test is the group G53. So five for five dimensional nilpotent Lie group and three is the third example on the list. So here's the Lie algebra. So the X1 does not occur in the Lie brackets. So X1 is the center. And so we get, well, complicated ex polynomial expression in the center. Uh, then we have something that resembles the Heisenberg multiplication and the rest is just or the usual addition. This group possesses a one parameter family of irreducible representations that are square integrable model at the center and they act on L2 of R2. So two variables and the representations look like that. Okay, some formula. Again, we notice a translation uh, with respect to the group parameters or group variables x3 and x5. The variables of the function are s and t. So one part of the representation is a translation. Then we have e to something and we identify x4 e to the two pi lambda x4 s. So that's a modulation in the by lambda x4 in the variable s and e to the negative two pi i lambda x2 t. So modulation in the variable t and writing that as an inner product. This part is responsible for modulation. So modulation is part of this representation. Now this part here does not depend on the function variables s and t. So taking inner products, integrating over s and t, taking absolute values, this drops, so this is not relevant. Okay, so nothing new so far, but now comes the interesting part, it's this here. So x4 is the fourth variable of the group and t squared, second variable of the function. So here comes a, a new operation. It's e to the two pi I lambda, or e to the pi I lambda x4 t squared. So polynomial multiplication by e to some polynomial. Uh, engineers would call that chirp because you have a linear increase of frequencies. I guess in number theory, that's called quadratic character. So there are plenty of names for that. So this is the interesting part that we have to look at. And, uh, So we have, now we can form, form cor the Corbett spaces. So in other words, we take the inner product of this function, of this 
representation with a function f and then take integral with respect to the variables x3 to x6. We know everything about them, duality, Banach space property, atomic decompositions, et cetera, et cetera. But does the definition give us anything new? Do we get anything new from this definition? How would we distinguish these corbits from the modulation spaces that we know quite well? And uh, I remember when David Rottensteiner was a postdoc in Vienna, we occasionally discussed that problem. And he said in his thesis, this was left open. And uh, before publication, he has to, do, he, he should add that. And basically I always reacted maybe a little bit too lightly and not serious enough saying, well, look, these groups have different uh, invariance property and therefore the Corbett spaces must be different. Uh, well, this is now a, not how it worked out for David, but at some point I decided to take myself serious and go into that and look at it. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So the representation space in both, in, in many cases is L2 of R2, two variables. So we have functions of two variables with a norm. How do we distinguish? these function spaces? Well, essentially we would need to construct an element that is one, but not in the other. And uh, so how would we do this in the case when the representation looks like that? Well, I've already tried to show you a little bit about the anatomy of this representation. And notice the interesting part is the multiplication by a chirp. So in, in the theory of modulation spaces, multiplication by a chirp occurs. And in the later developments, okay, using modulation spaces for analysis of say Schrodinger equation, okay, multiplication of a chirp is natural there because that's the Schrodinger evolution. So we know quite a bit of how multiplication by chirp acts on modulation spaces. And this is, uh, I would say, the, the main, main serious uh, result that we have to look at. And since I think it's quite useful to uh, do that in more generality, so we look at functions of d variables and we have e to some quadratic form, a real quadratic form parameterized by symmetric d by d matrix C. And uh, okay, so then we calculate the short time Fourier transform of multiplication by such a generalized chirp acting on the Gaussian. And the window we choose is also a Gaussian. So we have Gaussian, time frequency shift of a Gaussian, and in the resulting integral, we have also this uh, term with a quadratic phase. When you do that, you're left with Gaussian integrals. You can look that up and work on that. And you get a formula for this particular uh, short time Fourier transform. When you try to, okay, now the Corbett space, the modulation space norm is the integral of the P norm of this expression with respect to X and Y. Okay, that looks doable too. I hope you agree. And as a result, you get the corporate space norm of the Gaussian multiplied by, by a chirp is the determinant of four times identity plus this matrix C that parameterizes the chirp, determinant of this to some power. So if P is equal to two, then the power is zero. So we get one, and obviously this is a unitary operation on L2. But on modulation spaces, it's not. If P is less than two, this, uh, this uh, so this is determinant greater than one. So if P is less than two, this norm grows. Uh, the, I would say that the calculations about Gaussian integral are nicely 
done in Folland's book on harmonic analysis on phase space. I think somewhere in Hermann's books for Schrödinger equation, uh, Elena Cordero and Fabio Nicola did that several times. But so this is a calculation you do. The insight is we know that modulation spaces are invariant on a multiplication by chirps, but this calculation uh, tells us that the multiplication by a chirp is no isometry on, on the modulation space. So here's <clears throat> sort of some, some, some analysis to be done. And now comes the main observation. Maybe one, once more, some, some group five dimensional, it has a square integrable representation modulus center, looks like this. So this is a group of operators consisting of translations, modulations, and a particular multiplication by a chirp. You take the transform and take LP norm of the transform, gives you a Banach space. And the result is this Banach space is, does not coincide with any of the unweighted modulation spaces. And I would like to give you a, a sketch of the proof. So we single out, well, first of all, I'll normalize to lambda equal one. There are too many parameters and formulas anyway. So we take a one parameter group where all the coordinates in the group are zero except the fourth coordinate. In that case, uh, the, the representation is just a multiplication operator. It's modulation in the variable S, parameter X4, and it's multiplication by chirp in the variable T. Now, one of the important properties of Corbett spaces is they are invariant under the representation. And on the unweight, the Corbett's of LP, the representation is actually an isometry. So on the Corbett space, with respect to this group and this particular representation, this is a one parameter group of isometries. So these operators act as isometries on the Corbett of LP. Now let's look at the action on, of these operators on the modulation space MP. So it's some modulation, modulations are isometries on, modula on modulation space. That's where the M comes from. And it's multiplication by chirp in the second variable. And the chirp is in the second variable. So that amounts to the matrix 0, 0, 0, 1. The square of that is again 0, 0, 0, 1. If you plug into this formula here, you have four times identity plus uh, x squared. So you do that and you get some constant times four plus x four squared to some power. So this operation modulation combined with chirp behaves like x four to some positive power. In other words, this one parameter subgroup acts unboundedly on the modulation space as long as it's piece below one. Uh, from this, you can now construct an element that's in the Corbett of LP of this group, but not in the modulation space. If P is greater than two, you use duality. If P is not equal to Q, you say, you know that the spaces are isomorphic to sequence space LP, sequence space LQ, so they must be different. So that's in a, in a nutshell, the argument that the insight is in order to prove the difference of Corbett spaces, you look at their invariance properties and look at the different, different invariance properties should lead to the conclusion that the Corb families of Corbett spaces are different. So this is uh, 
what I showed you for the unweighted ones. And of course, once you got that idea, you can do many other things. I made sure that you get uh, the Corbett space does not coincide with any weighted modulation space. Once again, as a reminder for P equal two, the whole thing breaks down both on this level of computation and also for abstract reasons. The Corbett of L2 is just the representation space. And for both groups, it's L2 of R2. <coughs> so here we have a, a new family of function spaces on, of, on functions of two variables that uh, could say always existed, but did not receive attention for whatever reason. Let me give you one more example, just to show you how, how I got into the business. So you go through Nielsen's list and, and check, first of all, you check that representation of whatever group is square integrable modulus center. Uh, this is a six dimensional uh, group. It has two dimensional center. So only this part is important. So in the coordinate X4, you have something like Heisenberg multiplication. And again, you have a two parameter family of square integrable representations. Again, it, the formulas look all very similar, it depends where you have the quadratic term. Uh, they all look very similar at first glance. You have translation, you have modulation, modulation, modulation here, phase factor, phase factor. That's all fine and under control. And then again, you have a chirp here, the S squared. So it's quadratic in, in the function space variable. And when you go through the motions that I have shown you before, you can see that the Corbett spaces for this group of operators and for this nilpotent Lie group differ both from the standard modulation spaces and they also differ from the modulation space with respect to this five dimensional nilpotent Lie group. Always P, Q between zero and one, P not equal to two because then you know, they all co coincide. So we now have three families of functions or distributions of two variables, and they all are distinct. They don't occur. Uh, they are, they're all distinct. Uh, that's basically insight, the insight that I, I wanted to communicate. Uh, plenty of questions to ask, of course. Uh, finally, the last example is the so-called Dean and Folland group. That's what Fischer, Rottensteiner, and Ryszanski were interested in. Uh, they originally called it the Heisenberg group, the group of the Heisenberg group. What you have here, the action on the variables, which are now called T3, T2, T1, is Heisenberg multiplication. And they found a kind of uh, modulation that gives a group and this is the representation. So what's interesting here that it's not a mere translation, it's the translation that amounts to multiplication in the Heisenberg group. So R3 is interpreted as the Heisenberg group. You have modulations here, but the main thing is again, a chirp. And with the argument that I showed you, you can verify that the Corbett spaces of the Din and Follon group, at least of LP, do not coincide with the modulation spaces MP. Uh, of course, they did it in, in more generality with the mixed norm spaces, but you should compare the two proofs. The, the published proof identifies the Corbett spaces with respect to the Din and Follon group with a decomposition space. So these are spaces that are defined by 
partitions on the Fourier side. And Freud plane approved all sorts of embeddings and equalities. It's a huge, huge work. I think the published version is more than 180 pages. And you need to dig in deeply to, to, to find the material that you need. So I think a one page proof via the observation that there is a chirp in this representation and the invariance property is different from the invariance properties of modulation spaces uh, has something new to contribute to their work. So I think uh, I can finish now. Uh, I think it would be interesting to study more explicit examples in, in the direction of nilpotent groups. As I tried to say in the beginning, solvable groups and generalizations of wavelet theory are well studied. Semi-simple Lie groups are not so well studied, but there is some material. General, Lie group, general nilpotent groups are uh, hardly studied at all, except on a super abstract level in, in the connection of quantization. And that's probably where some interesting application should occur. Of course, I think the most interesting question to ask is, what is that all good for? And I do not have a really good answer to that. One should probably go to the people who have done abstract quantization procedures on nilpotent Lie groups. So finally, uh, what I showed you is some anecdotal evidence based on three, four examples that different invariance properties coming from different groups and representations imply that the Corbett spaces are different. And if I look at these examples carefully, then I may conjecture or at least suggest that if the groups of operators that are generated by the representations are equal on the same Hilbert space, then the Corbett spaces should be the same. What I showed you that in all these representations, I found say a one parameter subgroup that's not contained in the other representation. And uh, this is basically work uh, with me, let's say most minimal progress, but this is sort of a working program that I think some people are, should join. So with it, I want to finish. Thank you. Uh, I have a few references that may be of interest and thank you. So um, let's see, Elliot, uh, thank you very much for the talk, uh, Charlene. Um, we have Gustavo here also. Hi, Gustavo. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, thank you very much for this very nice talk. A uh, lot of material and uh, the, the, the chirp phenomenon that you were showing uh, actually in the examples looked uh, tightly connected to the homogeneity of the group. Um, these these were, with, were all nilpotent Lie groups with, uh, at, at least if, uh, if I did not miss anything, they yes. had a homogeneous structure with respect to some dilations. Uh, uh, let's see, yes. Well, I, I, so what's your question? That my question, my question was, uh, you you actually showed the the, the chirp phenomenon in uh, uh, in groups uh, up to step three, so with the, with the homogeneous dilations uh, uh, increasing uh, towards the steps. For example, there was this uh, G five uh, three, yes. I guess that had uh, that had uh, like uh, uh, the Lie algebra had three generators then with one bracket one could generate another one and then with the with the other brackets everything 
falls down in the center and that produced the uh, chirp, a chirp. And I was wondering if this was some like general fact that if you, as long as you go on increasing the, 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 the step of the stratification, you get higher order chirps and so higher order non-equivalence of corbid spaces. Uh, okay, let's see. So the, I think what you refer to is the, the, uh, the number of steps of the nilpotent groups. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, all, all these groups in low dimension have, uh, are homogeneous groups. They are graded groups, so they have a dilation acting on them. Uh, you have to go to much higher dimensional examples to find a group without dilation. Uh, up to dimension six, there's exactly one example where you have actually a cubic polynomial in the exponent. And uh, there, even, even that example is interesting. It's dimension six. I think it's three or four step nilpotent. And for a cubic, uh, sorry, cubic uh -huh. chirp, if you want, uh, the argument I g gave you fails because uh, I, I don't know of any explicit uh, explicit calculations. You know, everything I showed you with chirps is based on explicit calculations. So here, here comes sort of the question to the hard analyst. Uh, I, I think the, the modulation spaces are not invariant under multiplication with a sort of uh, cubic chirp. But I never could find a reference. I thought Anita Tabak or some people in Torino had uh, investigated that, but I'm unable to find that. So even on that level, I don't, we don't know what to do. And I think that should be interesting for harder analysts. <laughs> I see. So already in dimension six with a, a third degree chirp, there is no, uh, uh, no, no, apparently there is no tool to deal with. Uh, Let's see, Jose Luis did, did show, showed, showed us something, but then he did look at the right representation. So I never wrote stationary phase anywhere in, in, in my paper, but uh, I, th I think at some point I thought we should look at stationary phase and, and see what, what, uh, what it does to the, re to the representation coefficients. But it's not worked out. These are just some words that I throw into the discussion. Okay, thank you. So, so yeah, maybe anything. what I sketched at the end uh, is a general program and there are questions on, on different levels. So the first level is just look at a concrete representation with a, at least cubic polynomial in the exponent and do something with it. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, I have one. Um, yes. So how, how far do you think you are for getting, uh, I don't know, a, a general theory for nilpotent Lie groups instead of with examples? Well, what do you mean by general theory? If you ask for atomic decompositions, I can write yeah. them down. I actually have them written. Ah, oh. So uh, you can write it down in this way. If you sample the group model is centered densely enough and let the rep representation act, then you get the frame for the Corbett spaces and you get atomic oh. decompositions. But this is just citing citing the thirty old year results. You can make that more explicit. Yeah. By the way, there, there's since you asked, there's a, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, you have orthonormal bases in the orbit. Uh -huh. So with the with time frequency shifts, you take the characteristic function 
shifted by integers, you take integer modulations, you get the northern normal basis. Mm -hmm. And the hundreds of papers on the Balian law phenomenon show that why these orthonormal bases are not good. They lack some kind of localization. Yeah. Now, for nilpotent groups, you have a similar phenomenon. Uh, David Rottensteiner and I proved that under plenty of extra assumptions. And just recently, Vignon Usa proved the general result that I had basically been after for 30 years. And for nilpotent groups, this is a theorem. And I think it's it's absolutely great theorem. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we can, we uh, thank again Charlie for the nice talk.